ABC Radio Suffolk with Leslie Dolphin. Guest with us today, as I say, is an author, Jane Wilson Harris. She's just uh, published. It's, it's the most beautiful story. The uh, advantage of me being off slightly poorly yesterday was, of course, was that I could sit and read your book properly and actually have mm-hmm. time instead of trying to read a book just before I go to sleep and fall asleep. I actually spent most of last night engrossed in your book which was fantastic uh, so uh, jane wilson hath the uh, title of the book is a glimpse of eternal snows a journey of love and loss in the himalayas and i've described it i mean it's a, a story of living in nepal with your family and right. and alongside it is also the the really poignant story uh, of david who is your second son that's right and I, and I wasn't sure how to describe it. Really. I said he was he's born with with problems. Was, yes. is that, would that be? I mean, as a doctor, it's probably hard for you. As yes, well, I mean, I could list what was wrong with him, but I, I guess that he. Um, I mean, the medics unkindly call <clears throat> people like David a, a badly made baby. That he had lots of lots of problems. He had holes in his heart, um, and um, one kidney, and lots of different problems. And he had intellectual problems as well. So he. He was thought that he wouldn't make old bones, and uh, and I, part of the story is about how we decided not to let him have open heart surgery, and we ran away with him to the the peace and tranquility of the Himalayas against medical advice, which was um, well caused us quite a lot of guilt and grief um, internally, but I think ended up being the right decision. It must. It's interesting because as a doctor, both of you, you and your husband. Uh, have sort of got medical knowledge and you, well, my husband's doc- an engineer but yes and you, you're a doctor so yes. you've got a lot of knowledge yes. as well it, it must have it must have been a, and, and it comes out in the book really an interesting path to, to look at it from a mum's point of view and then at a doctor's point of view yes. and you do separate them out really I at- try to and I suppose it you know I sometimes make it makes makes me feel a bit schizophrenic. I have these conversations with the the, the mother in me having an argument with the doctor in me. So, uh, but it was interesting actually in the, in our times in Addenbrooke's Hospital with David. Even my husband, who is not medically trained, felt that the doctors were being inconsistent and were trying to get us to do things that, that they didn't they couldn't really justify in terms of improving David's uh, quality of life. So that was the, that was the big thing. Um, that we wanted to protect him and we wanted to give him the best life possible. Um, and when we were able to talk to medics who were more used to dealing with disability, uh, we, we found we were more empowered to, to have a more rational discussion about the issues, not just doing things because they could be done. It's almost a more rounded viewpoint, isn't it? Because because people didn't know exactly what was wrong. Yes, And so exactly. they were desperate to find out. And yes. each, each individual doctor was doing their bit. Yes. But when you sat back and looked at the whole picture, which mm. I think hospices tend to do now. If you go and talk I to know. people and in I th- And I think GPs as well. I think uh, increasingly, I, I work as a, a GP as well as in the travel clinic in uh, locally. Um, we do much more looking at the whole person and translating the, the, the hospital garbage into something that's swallowable. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, yes, I think the holistic approach is sometimes lacking. This all happened uh, a while ago, it so, did. so hence you've been able to write it and, and yes. publish it. And, it. and the writing was from diaries, I think, you kept at the time, aren't they? Well, some of it was diaries, some of it was letters I wrote to my parents and friends and relations. Um, I actually start, The book I started writing was actually not David's book. It was a book about being an expatriate in a difficult place. And I thought it would be funny because um, in in Nepal I was trying to learn Nepali, uh, which is, it, it's a fairly straightforward language, but it's got all sorts of strange um, sounds, like having to stick your tongue to the to your tonsils and make sort of noises. Um, so there are, for example... Uh, I would say for, something for uh, me, well, if uh, you can uh, remember. <laughs> well, the, one of the problems I had was um, there's a, a, a word, banta, which means to vomit, which is actually very close to banta, which means an aubergine. <laughs> so I would ask people to go and buy vomit for me in the market. So, <laughs> so some of the sounds were, you know, difficult for me to hear as an outsider. So, so I started off writing a book about, the, you know, the entertainments of, of living in a, an expatriate situation, trying to make fun of myself as the memsab, really. Um, and then a, a, a literary agent who was looking after me at the time th- actually read some of the early drafts and said, there's, there's no soul in this book, what are you hiding? Which I thought was amazingly astute of her. And I, didn't, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't at the time wanting to, to share David's life 
with anybody because it was private to us and uh, and we were going through a difficult time sort of dealing with it all um but when I decided to put David Center Stage then the book started to come together and I I started to enjoy writing it sometimes enjoy sometimes it hurt but uh, it it became a book that I think I hope is worth reading and and when I spoke to you briefly on on the telephone mm. I was saying it must have been quite therapeutic because yes. it's meant you've revisited mm. yes. the time and but actually has that been quite good it has been good and actually there's all sorts of things between Simon my husband and I that that have come out since I wrote the book um, things that I thought I'd protected him from that he was perfectly aware of going on and that was quite interesting that he's quite a, a quiet undemonstrative sort of person and he was dealing with it all in his way while I was clucking around and tearing my hair and beating my breast and and, um, and I think um, it was interesting that we was we were very much um, together on this in the way we were thinking and it was very encouraging really to discover that um, that we weren't as, as separate or as um, isolated as, as sometimes I thought we were. And, uh, as a GP, I'm sure, sure you're aware of often when families go through traumas like this, when you, you lose a child, people do often find that they can't maintain relationships. Yes. Because you can only cope for you, can't you? Yes, you, you it can't can be that. cope for all the other people And, and well. there is all this about trying to protect your partner from hurt as well. And I think you, try, you do try to, yeah. to do your best and it, and it, and it can be horrible. Because it almost hurts more for them to hurt than it does for you to hurt. Yes, it? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, it, and, and I think particularly i mean chaps in general are quite bad at expressing themselves aren't they and i think uh, i think my husband he's he's wonderful but you know he's he's very much internalizes everything and i think suffers terribly possibly because of it we, it's just that thing men and women are just not the same no, we, aren't, we aren't we aren't should we, should just just put the book in context because you paint the most beautiful pictures of this sort of colorful noisy chaotic almost lifestyle of an yes. apartment and you yes. ended up out there because simon is a water engineer That's is that right. right so he yes. was doing works in the country and often he was out of the country when you were here That's right. with david as well that's right so yeah so we've always been a, a very a, quite an independent couple really we got married quite late and i think we're we're used to um doing our own things um but i was also i was also trying to do some medical work as well um but i think the um david didn't see very well but he responded wonderfully to sound and uh, some of the you know raunching gear sticks and um cockerels squabbling and kids shrieking that m- made him come alive and actually i think was a tremendous stimulus to him and i think the colors actually made him look better than you know a grey ipswich day might have done mm-hmm. so so th- you we're planning on going to Nepal for a couple of years anyway because of Simon's job. That's right. You were pregnant and you had David. And, and it took a long time for people, although at the back of your mind you knew there was something wrong, you didn't even acknowledge it to yourself. And it took quite a long time for you to, to come to terms with the fact there were problems of them, sort them all out. That's right. And then you had to make this choice as to whether you were going to still go out to Nepal or yes. not, didn't you? And in fact, the doctors said, no, you must stay in England. You, uh, David must have open heart surgery. Um, you can't possibly go back to a village in the middle of nowhere. Um, he's too sick, and you know you, it will be a terrible thing to do to him. And at that point, we started. I started wondering, what are we doing? You know, what are we going to be doing for David? What is going to be the best thing for him? Um, at the time when all this was going on, they were taking blood samples from him, and the 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 sound of him crying every time they came up and stabbed a needle in it just completely broke my heart and and I I wanted to just scoop him up and run away and that was eventually what pretty much what we did and it's interesting though because you have your medical knowledge as well so yes. you, so you were able to weigh up in uh, hope yes. in your head weren't you whether yes. the blood because t- I think you felt that a lot of the blood tests were just being done and, and really they weren't going to prove any any use one that's way or the right other. it did see, it did feel like that but I think the big thing was the open heart surgery and I knew that um, he had a 10 percent chance of dying if they opened up his chest and um, patched up the holes in his heart and when I said well is he going to survive? Is this going to do him any good? I think the the, the sort of eye contact went, and and I, um, it just didn't feel as if what they were planning to do to him was necessarily going to help him. And I knew that open heart surgery would hurt him. You know, and people do are sore after they've had their ribs open. The bit in the book where you describe it, mm. you say, you know, if you have one broken rib, it hurts, but if you have each one cut and opened up and so on. That's right, yeah, I know. So I just didn't want him to go through that if it wasn't going to actually improve his quality of life. And and he, his brain, as he said, were, there were problems, weren't yes, there? It wasn't right. trying to say he was never going to 
suddenly leap up and walk and run around. That's what um, the neurologist thought, although it, 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 it's always very difficult to prognosticate with small babies. Uh, and so I think that was the big, the big difficulty was nobody really knew what was going to happen to him. And so it was all matters of opinion from one so that was the difficulty, really. But you decided that uh, a year, the operation could wait a year, and that That's you would right. go for a year, didn't That's you? That's exactly right. And he did change. And, he, 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 and he started to put on weight. Um, he went from being tube-fed and vomiting a lot to getting really chubby and chuckly and started to communicate with us. And um, when I brought him back, having been, I felt as if when I left that everyone thought I was completely mad, and probably I was half mad at the time, when I brought back this plump chubby cheeked um tanned smiling because he didn't little, smile before no did exactly smiling little chap the nurses on the ward who remembered us well said oh gosh you've done such a good job and actually he ended up fixing the holes in his heart himself as his heart grew and he's th and he thrived he got a lot better so the uh, getting away to the to the himalayas was good for him the other thing that was good is that in nepal they haven't got the luxury of sanitising their disabled people. Disabled people aren't put away in, in places where nobody sees them. So they're part of the community. And people aren't embarrassed by disability. And we found that helpful too. People um, would look at David and comment on his, his blonde curls and his lovely skin and his big chuckle, uh, his big bright smile. And, and that was nice for us as well, because in Britain people would see a disabled baby and then no, not know what to say. And that's the, one of the British um, concerns, isn't it? You know, if you meet someone who's got a problem, I won't know what to say. And that's, the, you know, people worry about that, don't they? I think that's changed since I was quite young. Because when I was at primary school, we'd have people come to school who right. had problems and so on. Mm. And, and, and I don't think we thought it any different, really. It was just part yes. of life. Yes, yes. Yes, whereas we're, it's become it's a sad, isn't it? It is, it is. We'll yes. come back and talk more. Okay. And uh, talk, I'm, I'm dying to know, because when you first left university, didn't you go and study some caves? I did. <laughs> Very, and we'll talk a bit about health and the, the travel <laughs> clinic as well. But uh, we'll remind you, we'll tell you a weeny bit more, tell you the, uh, the ending as well. So A Glimpse of Eternal Snows is the book, and uh, Jane wilson Howarth is with us. I'll give you all the details and make sure you know publisher and all that sort of thing as well. So I guess you probably prefer a tropical disease to just a boring old virus that makes oh, us all snuffle. Not at all, really. I mean, I think what's fascinating about general practice is how... You know, half a dozen people come in with very similar illnesses and react in completely different ways to it. And I think that's what's the, what's the fascinating thing about the job, really. Mm. So, mm. And, and each, each person that comes in is a voyage of discovery as well, because yeah. you could have almost anything coming through your door. Yes, yes. Returning travellers or little babies or anything, really. Yeah, it's a voyage of discovery. We'll talk about the travel <laughs> clinic as well, because yes. I imagine you talk immunisation. Do you deal with yes. tropical diseases? We do only deliver, or we try only to deliver um, pre-travel immunizations and uh, malaria advice um, but we do occasionally get people coming back who've been bitten by uh, potentially rabid animals so we try and get them to go to their GPs and get it sorted out but we, d we do end up getting quite a few telephone calls from people who come back and don't just, feel well. Yeah, who've been traveling. Mm, and but actually I mean it, the, the, the clinic is a, is a private thing and we don't really we shouldn't be taking money from people they, they need to just go and see see a local uh, nhs doctor do you get i mean and, and do people travel lots do you see people who yes need, yes um, huge amount yeah you need well, large numbers of yellow fever yes unfortunately there are there are quite a lot of immunizations but I mean, what we try to do is is rationally look at what people's risks are um, so they don't have things they don't need because, you know, for example, Japanese encephalitis is a disease that's seasonal um, in uh, so in this time of the year um, in the seasonal bits. So in the tropics, it's not seasonal, but, you know, sort of North Thailand, for example, it's it's probably quite a low risk. So it's not just a matter of looking at the country and thinking, OK, that's the jab that you need. It's like us when we went to Kilimanjaro. Mm. Uh, did we need the rabies or not? In fact, mm. I think one of us did, but the rest of us thought chances of finding a, a rabid dog halfway up Kilimanjaro yes. are remote. So yes. I have to say I didn't. Yes. But did it, as you say, it's like weighing up the... It the, is. But we all took malaria pills. And also, I mean, yellow the, fever. how far you're going to be to, to a decent clinical facility as well. You know, if you're going to be months up country, then obviously you need more than if you're going to be able to get home or get to 
a capital city. And I guess you are fairly expert having travelled the world quite a lot yourself. Um, well, I, I like to think I am, but there are I mean, obviously many, 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 many countries that I've not been to and things do change. And uh, yeah, so uh, and be- because most of us who work in the clinic are all interested in travel, we swap stories. So we, I hope we, we all learn from each other and yeah. from our, and from our travelling clients. We've got some really gory stories. That oh, yes, can... <laughs> but, that, but that we have to keep those to ourselves. Yes, so. I was going to say they're not for, for, your, for, no, for everybody absolutely. else's public consultation. <laughs> Indeed. Let's get like, get like, before we come back to your book and, mm. uh, and talk about uh, the book and uh, David as well. Uh, let's just gallop through your life. I mean, you've not always been local, have you? No, I was brought up in the um, Surrey suburbs, actually. It's, um, where my dad was from Northern Ireland and uh, cycled up to work in Tooting. And uh, my mum taught as domestic science in Mitcham, so, so it's, uh, North Surrey, really. But I don't know, I found um, the Surrey suburbs a bit stifling, really, and started to, to look around. And I went off to Plymouth to, to do a degree in zoology. Before that, you wanted to be an air hostess that's right. or oh, a game warden. That's right. I, I actually ended up writing to, to um, national parks in Africa and saying, give us a job. I, Is it, I noticed you made a note of the fact that you were a middle child. Do you think was, it was that that made you want to be sort I don't of know, get out it, and do I don't know what it is. We, I mean, we, middle child, children are a, a wee bit odd, as my dad would say. Um, I'm married to a middle child. I think it's interesting. He's a wee bit odd too. I think we, I think you just have to make your, make your mark separately, don't you? You have to, get, have to make yourself heard, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you did zoology? I did zoology uh, and I got interested in, well, I, I, mean, I suppose I'm... I think I was interested in bugs and creepy crawlies even from, you know, being very small and pond dipping when I was a child and it sort of just developed onto that really. So how did you come to go and study uh, to record the wildlife of Himalayan caves? I don't know, it's an odd odd thing to do really. I I mean I was doing, I I did a a little bit of uh, a research project when I was doing my zoology degree and I was thinking what can I do that's different and interesting and I'd started caving, sport caving and realized there were funny little creatures running around underground um <laughs> nothing noxious you know white little bouncy things with no eyes and i thought how on earth can something with no no eyes find its way around and started getting interested in how things manage in the complete darkness you know bats echolocating and and shrimps that uh, that can't see um and i did a little ecological project on on devonian cave life and then managed to blag some money from the winston churchill uh, traveling um scholarship so that I could go off to Nepal and and I had to make it sound a bit academic and I thought oh I'll I'll do some cave ecology in the Himalayas because nobody's done that before and so um, found all sorts of interesting creatures with great long feelers and how interesting yeah no there were some bizarre did you find any that no one knew about did you discover yes yes with lots of quite a lot of animals um, new to science in fact I named a new springtail after Sir Winston Churchill they're little tiny little um, bouncy wingless insects that um uh, that generally live in caves eating guano and, and it wasn't until some years after I'd named this creature after Swinston Church I thought actually some people might not think that's a particularly nice thing to have done really. We, we all know what guano is it's, it's the David Attenborough and it's, <laughs> it's bat poo isn't bat it? Poo, that's right. <laughs> there are so many words for poo it's great. <laughs> and I think so, so you must have studied bats and things in caves as well. Indeed and I was you know doing things like screening them for rabies and uh, trying to, and looking at parasites on bats and seeing if they were spreading things so just trying to do some stuff that would be useful um, information for people traveling after me really and that was your first experience then of the Himalayas of Nepal that's right yes yeah and uh, I happened to bump into a rather a nice um, water engineer um, who called was, Simon by his name how, how did you how did you guess <laughs> in and we had dinner together in Kathmandu with a load of other volunteers as he was at the time and um, we didn't really connect particularly, but he ended up at Southampton University where I, was, where I went and studied medicine. And he came to a lecture I did about my trips to Nepal and started asking all sorts of intelligent questions. And I thought, hmm, oh, that's interesting. And he said, I think I was in Nepal at the same time as you're describing. And I looked in my diary and there was a mention of Simon the Engineer. And uh, that, well, one thing led to another and... Uh, so that <laughs> you said in your book that you that you think that maybe you were quite patronising because you'd been away and thought That's you right. were the bee's knees, Absolutely. I think, at that stage. Yes, yes. And then you suddenly realised he'd probably had vastly more experience. He'd come back after five years. I'd come back after um, less than um, 
two or three months, really. <laughs> so, and how, 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 where did the decision to come back uh, and then train to be a doctor? Where did that come from? Well, I I, um, I went to the Himalayas and and ended up um, in a remote valley um, treating people for cuts and grazes and, in, and infected wounds uh, because people didn't understand about infection. They didn't understand about wound care, um, and I managed to do some health education through the kids. The, the kids in the valley were very patient. We didn't speak any local language. Um, and they understood what I was trying to communicate about washing wounds and before um, applying any medicine. And we managed to have a small impact. We didn't stay in this place very long, a few weeks, I think. We managed to have quite an impact on uh, reducing wound infections just by teaching people about washing after lacerating themselves. And I thought, this is good stuff. I really could get into this. If we can really, if it's so easy to improve the lot of people who don't have that information, wouldn't it be wonderful to do some work towards improving the lot of the poor? And I came back and did some work on parasite control uh, with a vet, um, and then got into medical school a bit later on with this passion, thinking I was going to go and cure the world, go off to the tropics when I was qualified and do good works. No, make a difference, but Yes, that's, yes and, exactly. and, and you did carry that through and, and, I did. and want to work when you are in Nepal, didn't you? That's right, yes. And I, I've done I've worked, I've, I've done about 11 years of, of clinical medicine in various corners of um, Asia. So quite a lot on health education, quite a lot on... Um, Child survival, as the Americans call it, i.e. looking at a health education that um, reduces infant mortality and um, so forth. There's a really descriptive passage in this book uh, of when you go and you get given a guided tour of, of one of the maternity hospitals. Yes, and, yes. Uh, it must have been, I, I, you made it fairly clear how difficult it would be for you to walk around and not to intervene. Yes, but, exactly. But isn't it tough to work where it's really basic, where there aren't the drugs? and, and it, so it is tough, but um, the clinicians in those environments are absolutely brilliant. They don't really rely on anything but their clinical skills and um, and I have sat at the feet it feels like sitting, sitting at the feet of a great guru uh, a, a gynaecologist who worked in, uh, in the western end of the Himalayas in Ladakh who was amazingly good and all she had was a blood pressure machine and a stethoscope she just did everything you know not even scans or x-rays and, uh, and so it can be really inspiring uh, and it's so much easier to do more for more people with 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 just straight antibiotics and and good knowledge and no red tape. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. In general practice, I spend quite a lot of time uh, filling in forms. Because there, you just see people and, and do your best, mm, and here right. you fill in forms, use the computer, right. and it we must don't be have the Care Quality Commission breathing down their necks and things such like that. Such a different world. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Just what was the best bit about Nepal? I mean, because it comes over as very colourful uh, in the book. I mean, the people there, did you...? I think it's to do with the, the, the straightforwardness of the people, that they will take, a bit like cancer sufferers, they take one day at a time. If, even if they've had something really awful happen to them, they're looking forward, they're getting on with it, they're not blaming anyone. Um, you know, they, they're, they're fatalistic. This is the deal that, that they've been dealt by their, you know, their their fate and um they look forward and and just carry on really and i think um accept every they accept everybody f for what they can do so even someone who's disabled has um can contribute to the good of the community in some way and i think that's very positive and something we could learn from and uh, we started off by saying how hey, the book, A Glimpse of Eternal Snows, it's, it's a story about your life in, in Nepal, but it's also David's story as That's well. That's right. And uh, we've talked about how he, he was born with various problems, starting with a hair lip, mm. uh, and then, but you found out he'd got to probably neurological problems, right. no ki mm -hmm. one kidney missing, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, and holes in his heart and so on. And you decided that rather than keep on I think you demedicalized him something like that, that didn't you? So rather than yes. lots of having yes. lots of mm. uh, interventions and so on you thought it'd be nicer to go away and just to better try and live a, a relaxed life with him yes. and you did that yes uh, and came back now there is a sad end to the story yes isn't there? he did he did slip away before the age of um, three um, and I still don't really know what was wrong with him he became quite withdrawn I think he probably aspirated some stomach contents. He did, he did vomit a lot. Unfortunately, when you know he did seem to have a rather delicate stomach, and I think he aspirated.
vomit and then um, slipped away because you woke of that. up and found him breathing that's quite right. heavily. Didn't that's you? right. Yeah, and, and then, that sort of came out of the blue, did it? Because he had well, had he good was phases deterior- and bad that's phases. That's right. He was. Go- he'd go in and out of. Um, there'd be times when he would seem very withdrawn, and you know, he seemed to feel unwell. And I never really did know what was wrong with him, but I think he. It was almost as if he decided it was time to go. I don't know. He just it seemed to. But anyway, he slipped away comfortably. Um, and um, and I think I think it was a good death. I think he he got as much out of his life as he could have done. He had a lot of chuckles, and I think I think when we when we came to celebrate his life when at the funeral, we it was a it was a comfortable funeral. It was a really strange funeral. It was a there was a, a rather dour Scottish Presbyterian who ran the service, but we we snuck some the Tibetan Book of the Dead into his coffin, which was also which was very non Presbyterian, and <laughs> and there were prayer flags and all sorts of it was very ecumenical, and um, we had, yes, it was a nice celebration actually. But it's it's like fourteen, fifteen years ago, I think now, isn't That's it? Right, so yes. so time has passed, and yes. and and it's been easier to write it and so on. Are you comfortable with it all now when you look back? Because that's important, isn't it? I, well, I I still find myself wondering if he'd had his heart fixed would he have survived would he still be alive I mean I think parenthood is a guilt trip whatever you do and I think if you make a big decision like that you can never be 100% sure that it was the right thing but I think I'm probably 90% sure it was the right thing to have done but you know that he was happy because he laughed yes and... exactly yeah exactly and you and you had two other sons as well didn't That's you right. so you were having to put them look after them at the same time yes and I, and and some in many families if there is one sick child the other the other children really suffer for that and i've cu- i've come across quite a lot of families who've really struggled to the, the the rest of the family really that they're, they're they're dragged down by it really they don't have a proper childhood well i think i read just read it i think it's a really rich story and i'm i'm I feel privileged that you've shared it with us as well, really. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for, for writing it and coming in. Um, are you writing another book? Because you've written others. You've written travel books, haven't you? Yeah, I've written books. a book about Madagascar. I've written a couple of um, travel guides. So, you know, if you, you're in growing toenail, starts throbbing, you know, what to do with that. While you're away. Of, exactly. Ooh, how to pull out your own toenail. <laughs> not, not as nasty as that, no. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm actually working on some fiction as well but with the travel theme. So just, uh, just watch to, this space. Just to, to for, for play, really. Uh, do you think you'll travel again as well? Oh, absolutely. Because yes. I can't imagine you staying put for yes. very long. Yes, uh, and my husband's certainly saying he wants to do one more, at least one more big trip before, as a as a couple. Before where will we, it be? Where well, probably where just anywhere we can both get a job at the same time doing something useful. It'll almost certainly be Asia somewhere. Uh, it, it's likely to be somewhere we can speak a language, so we can both speak Indonesian and Nepali and a bit of Hindi. So, but we'll see. We'll see what 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 comes up. Well, good luck. Thank you. And very we'll much. get you back when you've got your next book published. Okay. It's been really <laughs> lovely. Thank you That's so much for coming in. Great pleasure. That's at Jane Wilson Howarth, and the book is A Glimpse of Eternal Snows. It's a journey of love and loss in the Himalayas.